for joining us on this webinar today of Unleashing Your Potential. Um, so I'm Heather Jane. I'm Welsh Development Coordinator for Endometriosis UK. And um, we're running this today in partnership with the Fair Treatment of Women in Wales. And I'll introduce my um, co-host very shortly. So um, please do have a look at sort of our website and have a look at all the other information on there. But today we're going to be hearing from um, some amazing professionals who are going to tell us a little bit about how they've got into the posts that they're doing, how they deal with their endometriosis um, during their work times. We're also going to hear from... Um, one of our endometriosis friendly employer champions who's going to tell us a little bit more about how their company have got into involved in this and everything um so please just relax enjoy it if you've got any questions then please do put those in the q a uh we're just going to be hearing from everyone first of all and then we'll go to the q a session um after all of that so we're going to be first of all hearing from d who's from fair treatment of women in wales HJ, uh, Good evening, everyone. Yeah, my name's Dee. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm FTWW's engagement officer. So FTWW, or Fair Treatment for the Women of Wales, is a disabled people's organisation, and we're the only patient-led charity in Wales dedicated solely to women's health equality. So we support, advocate for and empower women and people registered female at birth, including non-binary, trans and intersex people across Wales who are disabled and or living with chronic or recurrent health conditions. We were founded in 2014 and endometriosis was our first ever campaign and it continues to be a core campaign for us. As well as supporting those living with endo to access the care they need, we empower our members to have their voices heard uh, by health boards, Welsh Government, the Senna, and many more. We work co-productively with Welsh Government and the NHS to develop resources like Endometriosis Cymru, which is a bilingual website full of useful information that includes an excellent symptom reporting tool. Because of our work, endometriosis nurses are now in every health board in Wales, but we know there is a lot more to do. I have endo myself and my diagnostic delay was 23 years, which has impacted every single area of my life, including employment. So we're really excited to be working with Endometriosis UK on a series of webinars, this one's being first, not least because we support so many endo patients in Wales who have found it a struggle to pursue their chosen careers, often because many aren't aware of their rights to request reasonable adjustments, or because employers are unsure of how best to accommodate them. So Endometriosis Cymru has a whole section devoted to this issue, including how to raise it with your employer, and also links to Endo UK's fantastic endometriosis friendly employer scheme. Our website is currently being updated, but you can follow us on social media and join our Facebook group where we offer support and opportunities to get involved with our activities as well. Thank you very much. You're on mute, HJ. Yeah, thank you. I think I, <laughs> as a trainer, I would know this by now, but there we go. So, <laughs> so we're going to be uh, just do a little bit of an introduction to everyone and then they can um, go through their roles. So we're very lucky to be joined by Fionn from Welsh Rugby here today. And Fionn's going to be talking about how she got into rugby and how she deals with her endometriosis. We're also very lucky to be joined by three um, wonderful flight attendants from British Airways. Uh, Sarah, Abby and Holly, who are going to be chatting about their experiences. We're also joined by Tracy, who's also from British Airways, who she's going to talk about um, endometriosis friendly employer scheme um, and how they do it in British Airways. And then we're going to be talking to Bethan, uh, Beth from South Wales Police. So I'll start us off with Fionn. Thank you, Fionn. Hi, hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name's Fionn. Uh, I'm a Welsh international rugby player, uh, also a qualified PE teacher. Um, I played rugby literally most of my life. I started when I was six. Um, I'm from a really rugby uh, family, so there was no other way for me. It was just rugby. Um, so like I said, I'm a qualified PE teacher because I kind of thought 
with my passion for rugby, I kind of needed to go into a career where um, I could do something that would align with my rugby. I felt like oh, I could maybe I can't be something that works shift because you know I won't be able to play on the weekend. I won't be able to make training. Um, it was something that really worked with my lifestyle. Um, when I was younger, um, I really struggled with my periods. Um, you know, I was put on the pill because they were so heavy to try and manage them. But I just thought that, that was just the norm. I just thought that, you know, a painful, heavy period is what was normal for a woman, you know, going through that or, you know, a youngster going through that. So it wasn't something that I really flagged up. And it wasn't something I was really aware of, that it wasn't actually normal. Um, and then it wasn't until I transitioned to being a full-time professional. So I've been professional for about two and a half years. Um, and it wasn't until that period of my life where I really started to notice things that, okay, this this surely can't be normal. Um, my endometriosis was flagged due to exercise. So um, as much as obviously the, the issues with my periods, it was actually the exercise that really was a red flag for me. Um, basically, I have flare reps when I'm maximally, maximally exerting. So any hard running sessions or bike sessions or anything really physically demanding for a rugby player, <laughs> actually what flares men do. Um, as much as, like I said, I, I struggled with my periods, that was something I was able to manage uh, again because I just thought it was normal. Um, you know, I'd be in training with a hot water bottle or you know, taking a you know paracetamol to get through the day, but it wasn't until the exercise flare ups where I really thought, okay, I'm struggling to do my actual job here. Um, I was very fortunate that I had a very good medical care due to my job role that um allowed me to go and see a gynecologist Mr Griffiths uh, and that's when he asked me all these questions do you use a whole water bottle do you use medication to help your your period pains um you know are you heavy and I was flagging all these things and I was like oh wow um and then when I had my diagnosis it was kind of that feeling where I was like okay I'm not crazy <laughs> I'm not mad there is actually something wrong with me but then it was the other side of it where I was like oh wow okay there is actually something wrong um since my surgery, um, I have still struggled with my endo, but I, I'm very fortunate I've got um, female-led specialists in my team which um, help manage that for me. Um, they've, I've had days where I've done really difficult sessions where I haven't been able to complete them because of my endo, but then the management strategies that have been put in place for me next time is what's helped me kind of, kind of cope and plan ahead for that. Um, because obviously been really difficult to think you know am I going to be able to do my job um and in our rugby world endometriosis is something that's really new uh because no one really knows enough about it um and I've kind of been the guinea pig for that in my team especially to understand um understand what it is for a start and understand how to manage it um you know in rugby you're surrounded by males a majority of our staff are male coaches so to try and put that understanding into them to to explain you know what the symptoms are what I'm struggling with um fatigue is something that has been a really strong symptom and again as a mm -hmm. professional athlete when you train all the time um and you're tired anyway so then having that fatigue element on top um was something I found really really hard um but like even now like I talk about the management strategies there's parts in my day where I get longer rest in the day I have longer refuel time um, I have longer rest in between sessions. Um, like my training's been altered where, you know, if I'm having difficult days with flare-ups, I don't do any core-related uh, exercises in the gym. So I think, like I said, I went through a time where I was like, am I actually, am I, is there a future for me in rugby? Um, for, for so long to get have this as a profession, but the work that's been done in the background for people to help me to help manage it is what's something that's, yeah, been a real game-changer. Uh, and like I said, one thing I really advocate for is, is I'm not mad at people for not knowing, but it's the understand, understand having the understanding and, and being open to understanding and, and helping, you know, women like us. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, been a crazy journey. Um, I've been diagnosed for just over a year now. Um, and like I said, something I still drug, struggle with daily, uh, but something that, especially in a male-dominated environment, is something that I'm still really working hard on to kind of, you know, really share that knowledge and experience and really 
tackle it taboo and stigma around you know we can talk about women's health we can talk about periods it's fine um but yeah it's all about managing it and luckily we're on the right track to making that possible for me in my profession amazing thank you Fiona and such a journey as well and you're doing so great so thank you um, well, thank you <laughs> <laughs> just bring home the six nations that's that's all we ask you know when I need to get injury first <laughs> <laughs> okay so I'm gonna move to Sarah Abby and Holly who are just gonna have a little bit of a chat about how they've got into this and um and how they manage it Who wants to go first? <laughs> Shall I go? I don't mind going. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm an in-flight manager um, at British Airways and also a brand ambassador for the company. Um, I've been flying for, for nearly nine years. Um, I was a primary school teacher in another life. <laughs> um, so I started the main crew and then worked my way up. Um, I've been diagnosed with endo about seven years now. Um, I've also got Crohn's disease, so I'm a barrel of, of health in this area. <laughs> um, I've had two surgeries, um, one not successful at all because um, it was too extensive. And then my most recent one was November, what year are we in? 24, 22, <laughs> November 2022. Um, and I was lucky enough um, to find a really amazing surgeon who um, I had robotic surgery, the Da Vinci method of surgery with. Um, my endometriosis was stage four, all in my bowel, my bladder, and my kidney. So I actually um, I had a stent in my kidney for eight weeks. Um, I had a catheter for, um, I think it was just over a week. Um, so yeah, really not a very nice time. Um, but since then, you know, um, progress is good. He, he said he removed all the endometriosis. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, still attached to my hot water bottle some days. Um, and not without its challenges um, but yeah I'm just really passionate about you know supporting women um, especially in in our role I'm sure Holly and Abby will say the same like there are so many women who suffer but obviously different she's in a male dominated industry we're in quite a female dominated one so it's just you know you talk to so many people who if they don't suffer themselves they know somebody who does so it, it's really important we get the you know we, we get endometriosis and the aware the support out there shall I go <laughs> <laughs> I'll go <laughs> um so I'm Holly I've been with BA for about five and a half years now uh, before that I was a mortgage advisor very different um and yeah flying was always something I wanted to do but kind of put it off thought oh, I'll get the serious job and but actually it's such a great career move for me like I've really enjoyed it um going to BA knowing I had endo I was a little bit nervous because obviously you know flying bloating uncomfortable you just don't really know how it's going to affect you um but we have the, the um health service at BA and they do kind of like a medical assessment before you join so you have an appointment with a GP if you've got any sort of issues and so for me it was peace of mind that they were aware that I had that condition already um, and then obviously now later on down the line we've now formed our support group which for me was again a, a bit of a godsend because when I was diagnosed I was only 23 and I didn't really know anyone else so this is kind of a bit of a support group for me in the same way so it's good that we're spreading the word spreading the knowledge but also we can have a message to each other and say oh I've had a terrible flight I've had a flare-up or mm. there's been a lot of that this week <laughs> I think between yeah, us lots all. of therapy but, um yeah it's oh, really yes. nice <laughs> yeah <laughs> is it like my main go-to with this group is it is a support group like we can rely on each other and have these really frank conversations and it's really refreshing as I say for me for someone who kind of felt a bit lonely because I felt like I was really young and I didn't know what what was going on really it kind of came as a shock when I did get my diagnosis so for me this is yeah really important that we do keep talking about it really yeah so my diagnosis is slightly different to other people because I was very fortunate enough of getting referred from the GP getting my gynecology consultant and getting my surgery all within three months so from the start oh. to getting the diagnosis was about three, four months. 
So I'm very fortunate for that. But it has been going on for years, like everybody else. Oh, it's normal. It's normal to just take paracetamol, push through. You'll be fine. It's normal. It's not. And it took me years to actually realise and stand up and go to the doctors and think, I actually need to be seen now because this is getting ridiculous with flying. Mm -hmm. I'd start on my period and I'd be collapsing, throwing up, can't walk in pain, back pains. Nothing was helping. Never even heard of endometriosis before I got referred to a gynecologist. Didn't even... I didn't know about it. So I was speaking to a friend who introduced me to Tracy after a di um, after the diagnosis. Our good friend Sticky, Tracy knows her very well, introduced me and that's how I become part of the team. And just like with flying, meeting all these lovely girls, as Holly was saying, it's such a nice support network. I go on board with my pin. I've had great conversations with all the male crew, the male pilots. They're getting very informed. They see everything we do online. And it's becoming quite a very talked about subject when someone's on board with it. I've actually helped a few passengers. We had a passenger on my flight. I've just done a block of five days. I don't know what flight it was. It was one of those flights. <laughs> actually, <laughs> claps on board because it was day one of her periods. And she was throwing up. She was in pain. She couldn't walk. And she didn't know anybody else that experienced that. So being there for her trying to fly over I can't even, I think we're going to Milan just trying to fly over there she was just so thankful to have someone who understood what she was going through and she didn't realize she'd never heard of endometriosis I don't know what it's like out in Italy but just being there for someone else and having that experience and I lent her my fan when she was getting too hot and then she had my water bottle when she was getting the chills <laughs> which is very nice just to be able to help just someone else who doesn't really know what's going on with them. Thank you. I mean, that sounds absolutely amazing. It? it sounds like you're all, I mean, the support group that you've got going and it, the fact that the pilots and the other crew are starting to know more and understand what's going on. That's <coughs> really um, amazing. And Tracy, I know you've been quite instrumental in all of this, so... Would you been. like to go now? Yeah, uh, well, I'm Tracy. Um, I'm an endometriosis champion at BA. I do have endometriosis, and so far I've had four major surgeries. And unfortunately, I'm about to have another MRI this Thursday uh, for potentially has it returned? We'll soon find out. So, before I discuss the endometriosis renal employer scheme at BA, and I will refer to it during my talk as an EFE, so it's quite a mouthful every time to pronounce. Um, I just wanted, I extracted a paragraph of the EFE scheme from the charity. And I, I want to read this out to you before I relate it, because we um, very much obtained these objectives and uh, implemented them into our EFE scheme at BA. So the charity says that by overcoming the challenges individuals may face in the workplace due to lack of knowledge or, un or misunderstanding, the EFE hopes to see improvements in employee well-being, productivity, performance, employee engagement and morale. So we took those objectives and we have, you know, some we have implemented into our EFE and very much we are working to and expanding and strengthening the whole time. So I'll just give you a tiny background on BA first. We've roughly got about 28,000 employees. Um, the majority of our workforce are flying colleagues and that's made up with flight crew and cabin crew. Um, there are various job roles. There's a lot of shift workers from engineering in the terminal, two head office being Monday to Friday, nine to five. So there's a massive scope for us to obviously with the EF EFE scheme to provide that support too. Um, in March this year, um, which we're all immensely proud of, uh, we announced ourselves as being the first UK airline to be an endometriosis friendly employer. Um, this took us about 18 months to achieve this status. And the reason why it took us pro probably slightly longer than most companies is because we wanted all the structures to be in place. So when we announced ourselves, we had the sign posting, the community, community set up and information they're ready for people who were interested about our campaign and what we were doing. So initially we shared stories for internal comms, uh, we did road shows, we did fundraising for the Walk for Endo last July. I think there's a few of us on the chat tonight, we all very much enjoyed doing that. 
And we also set up a Teams community website. So this involves an abundance of information of signposting, uh, endometriosis has symptoms uh, to diagnosis your first doctor's appointment information on that to surgery recovery and support back into work one of the biggest that ethos towards this was to provide accurate information because i'm sure a lot of us will be nodding our heads going there's a lot of inaccurate information in in, in the endometriosis world i will get my words out and we we're very much keen obviously highlighting bsg accredited centers for those that are aware, obviously, it's an endometriosis specialist centre, as a lot of the operations involved in endometriosis, you do need a multidisciplinary team. Um, all this sort of combined was to help raise awareness, build our community, and raise the profile of endometriosis within BA. We're incredibly lucky to also have a focal uh, point of contact within BA. So that's within our British Airways Health Services. One of the occupational health advisors has come forward to help uh, support our campaign so this is again it's helped to strengthen our cause and hopefully provide better support to sufferers we've also developed guidelines um, this is available to all colleagues within the company for those who sufferers want to, or managers who want to know more about endometriosis or understand it more and it also shows the commitment from the company in highlighting policies which are in place to help support sufferers and the process they would need to go through um, we've been incredibly lucky, <laughs> or we have um, registered a charity under what's called the BA Community Fund. So if you're booking a flight through BA.com or you've, uh, you're an executive card holder, you can now donate your Avios points to the charity. So it's really, it's like developing a, um, you know, a connection with the charity. Uh, we're also working on leaflets, um, which we'll use on internal and external campaigns in the future. But probably, without a doubt, our biggest and strongest connection is the support which we receive from CMIG. Um, that is the Centre for Endometriosis to Minimal Invasive Gynecology. The lead consultant, a um, few of you might be aware of his surgeon's name, is um, Dr. Shaheen Kazali, and he's very well respected with his expertise and knowledge in, in the endometriosis world. Recently, Shaheen attended a clinical meeting at British Airways Health Services, where obviously endometriosis was discussed, along with pain management. And also he, he, he made a great point of explaining the associated debilitating symptoms associated with the disease. Um, as far as I was aware, the meeting went very well. And we hope through this engagement that we are in a position to better support sufferers. So how I see the EFE scheme, and I, it's, it's like a continuous circle and the four disciplines which we, we are always working for and going through and strengthening every time is obviously about communication, where we always share stories, fundraise, and do you know, we have our socials, so it's not all work. We try and meet up twice a year and it's, it's something which I'm not gonna lie, we all enjoy a glass of wine, a chit chat, we share some of the stories. And it's also in a way therapeutic. And as I said, um, it's, a, it's, it's the whole journey in developing new friendships through the disease is it's lovely. Um, so through the communication, we're going through engagement, through roadshows, meetings with bars, the wellbeing managers at VA, charity and CMIG. And we have developed some short and long-term goals, which we're working towards. And within that loop is feedback. So we're always trying to strengthen, take feedback on board. Through the first two, we're constantly then building our community where we have relevant signposting and updates and increasing the support and awareness to sufferers within our community. Going on to having a communication engagement and building our community, we'll be, be tackling stigma and changing culture. So, you know, are we being listened to? Yes, we have engagement from the company, uh, managers are coming forth and you know, we've got guidelines to offer. And I think through the whole circle, it's constantly strengthening the EFE scheme, which we have in place. Um, I'd like to finish this with probably saying, I see currently the strongest tool anybody could offer within a workplace is the EFE scheme. It's hard enough getting our voices heard or to, for endometriosis to be understood. So by implementing these, this scheme, scheme, you know, raising awareness, 
educating, we hope that this will be able to provide a better support needed to allow sufferers to achieve their, as their career aspirations and to thrive within the workplace. Um, yeah, that's about it from me, Heather. <laughs> I hope I haven't buff waffled on too much. No, that's great. Thank you, Tracy. So how many people roughly have you got in your support group um, within BA? So I think we're just coming up to shy of 40 champions and probably about 150 in our community at the moment, which is ah. the, so the team's community is something we set up and it's accessible to everybody. Um, but specifically we have, this obviously give people an option. Some people might just want to go to the community for signposting information or, you know, or you can come forward as a champion and get involved with road shows or sharing the story. But what's also been very good is that we have our first male champion as well. So we're actually, oh. we're actually sort of, you know, spreading out, it's obviously people coming forward to wanting to support loved ones as well. So we're looking to cover a bit more in the future about how to better support loved ones as well, to understand it, because that's another whole big scope. And, you know, with especially perhaps the pilot community, uh, you can say the cabin crew are predominantly female, <laughs> pilots are predominantly male. How many have ever got wives and girlfriends and, you know, suffering as well? So, yeah, it's we've got lots in the pipeline, which we're working towards. And it's been really exciting. And the journey is, I think, it's taken us all on. And I think we're all very, very passionate about it because at the end of the day, we're doing it in our spare time. So, yeah, we absolutely love doing it. Thank you. That's wonderful. I'm sure we'll come back to more questions in just a moment. Um, but I'm going to introduce uh, Beth again now from South Wales Police and let her talk about her story. Hi. So, yeah, I'm a detective for South Wales Police. Um, currently, we have just started the EFE again, Copy and Tracy, because I always get my words jumbled. Um, so we're at the beginning stages of that and we have a support group and a working group. Um, I have been in the police for 10 years, which makes me feel very old. Um, I joined as a PCSO initially in 2013 and then became a police officer in 2015. And I became a detective in 2018, I think. Um, always suffered with um, digestive issues, so IBS symptoms. Um, my periods were always okay. I never really saw the link until I came off the pill in 2020 because of COVID, I couldn't renew it. And then all the symptoms showed and came you know, forward and um, I was really, really struggling in work. And um, a lot of my symptoms were you know, the pain and the fatigue, which Fionn mentioned, but I got really bad brain fog um, and I would really jumble up my words sometimes. And um, an occasion that stuck out for me was day one of my period and I was due to interview a suspect. And I, I couldn't speak. I couldn't get my words out when I was trying to speak to my sergeant. And she sent me home um, and rung me the next day and said, have you heard of endometriosis? I, I think it's something you need to look into. Prior to that conversation, I've never even heard of endometriosis. I always thought I was allergic to bread and I just couldn't give it up. And that's why I suffered with all this pain. Um, so, yeah, my sergeant, who's now, you know, one of my best friends, bless her, has suffered with endometriosis for years and she pointed me in the direction of her consultant who did her surgeries and I paid for a private consultation because the NHS basically said we've looked at your file and you have IBS and um, it was Mr Griffiths and um, within five minutes he said I'm pretty certain you have endometriosis but you need surgery for me to give you a full diagnosis. I had that in July 2021 and I was diagnosed with stage four rectovaginal endometriosis so a lot of mine is bowel and bladder and I have some on the back of my uterus. Um, so again, I uh, went through that with work and um, told them all about my diagnosis once that come through. And then I was incredibly fortunate that I fell pregnant almost instantly and I went off on maternity leave. And coming back, I started my new job in major crime, which is um, investigating murders with a new sergeant who was male and had never heard about endometriosis. And I found my symptoms completely ramped up um, after my maternity leave. And I was struggling pretty much every two weeks uh, with ovulation pain and pain with my periods. 
Um, so I had a very open and frank conversation with him and sat him down and explained what endometriosis is. And he was incredible and listened. And um, I was offered working from home and um, everything to help manage my symptoms. You know, if there's been occasions where I've worked on um, quite similar to Fionn, I get quite bad fatigue and I get flare ups. I find when I've worked very long hours, um, they always support me and say, right, work from home next week. Um, let us know when you're ready, if you need to come in. And obviously in the process of all this, I found out that South Wales Police were working towards the EFE. So I instantly asked to be part of it. Um, and I'm working towards becoming a champion myself. And yeah, hopefully keep spreading awareness. And what's brilliant as well within South Wales Police is obviously my sergeant was very accommodating and listened but we too have males that have come onto the endometriosis working group um males of rank as well so you know being a police officer is a male dominated organization and they are coming forward and asking you know what is endometriosis what can we do to support female staff um and people who suffer with endometriosis and yeah it's fantastic to see really that's been talked about we've recently had a campaign where we did a road show um, as part of the Gender Equality Network and endometriosis was a talk amongst that. And we had really good feedback from that. And another thing that we've recently introduced is uh, working with the uniform stores to change the trousers that were allocated our uniform to be more accommodating to females, um, more bloke friendly, <laughs> um, uh, not so boxy as they were um so yeah that's something that's in the process now so it's early days for us as an you know an organization but we're hoping to get to uh the stage that british airways have got to that would be amazing so yeah that's my story that, that's amazing and although it sounds such a simple thing isn't it the change in the uniform that's going to make such a a major difference but the fact that you've got men listening as well and actually coming forward because Sometimes it's a case of, you know, women are listening to another woman, but a man may not. But often a case as well, that sometimes a man will listen and a woman won't. So um, it's fantastic. There's the support everyone's received. It's so lovely to hear everything. Okay, we've yeah. got one. Sorry. <laughs> we've got oh, one in, in the, um, the box a minute. So let's have a look. So these are to our flight um, attendants. Do you ever get worried about a flare up on the plane or in another country? And what do you do if that happens? It's always in the back of your mind because you never know when it's, for me, you never know when it's going to happen. Mm. So you've always got to be prepared. I've got my TENS machine. I have a hot water bottle. I have all the painkillers that I take, like my methanolic acid paracetamol, extra ibuprofen. I just all that have that to the ready, always in my bag, just in case, because you never know. Your sort of go-to kit. Yeah, Amazing. it's all in one little bag and it's in my case and it does not move unless it needs either replenishing or charging. <laughs> yeah. We That's how I cope with it. I just... Leon, um, but sorry. Go on. Pardon? Sorry, did anyone want to add, did any of you want to add anything more to that, that question? Just the same as, as Abby, really. I, I will not travel without my hot water bottle. <laughs> um, that's for sure. And I just think for me, um, I'm always quite open and honest over it. And um, obviously being a champion and being part of the EFE has, has made that even more possible. I, I always was. It wasn't something I was ever, you know, I ever found difficult to talk about. But um, I guess you know, being the manager it is kind of easier, whereas I want to kind of make that environment for my crew. So if somebody is suffering with endometriosis or something else, so it's just about being honest, you know, I'm, you know, I just need to sit down for five minutes and I'm not feeling great. And I've got this, this and then it is just, and just, I think just, yeah, just open, honest support, painkillers, as Abby said, and hot water bottle. Um, and yeah, always, always keep um, a copy of like my prescriptions and things as well. That's something that I never thought about before, but um, I've just come back from Saudi Arabia um, and Dubai. So a lot of the Middle East, you need to have a copy of your prescription. So that's mm -hmm. always with my painkillers and something to remember as well when you're traveling around. That's really good advice, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Because you don't always think about taking a copy of your prescription, do you? Or yeah. when you're <laughs> And then you get no, in trouble. Yeah. And you're like, you're not coming in. I'm going like, to well. Doha. 
Like, yeah, I'm going to Dover Abby. tomorrow, Sarah, so you've just reminded me to get yeah, my prescription Abby, ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, get it ready. I need to get that sorted tomorrow before I go to work. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me as well, like, I'm aware of some, like, food triggers and things I have. So mm. I will sometimes try and... I mean, we call it self catering, but basically take pack lunch on board. Mm. Um, so I, I did test well, uh, online thing. Is anyone else losing Holly, or is it just me? Yeah, losing no, Holly. Holly. <laughs> Am I back? Oh, she's back. She's back. Yeah, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know how far I got but basically I did a self-test thing for intolerances so whenever I feel like I'm having a flare-up there's certain foods that I know to avoid on board um we bloat anyway obviously but the pastas breads and things but then there's certain intolerances that I found that I had that just small things like rosemary and things like that that now I know if they're in the food on board I will just completely not go near when I know I'm having a bit of a flare-up as well so it's interesting as well that, that Beth said about the uniform for South Wales Police because we, we recently just changed, um, it's been about six months, I think, our, our new uniform. And um, so there's all different options now. So it, I've got into this habit without even knowing I've done it as I, I go to work, which is normally a day flight in my dress, which is a little bit more fitted. And then coming home, I wear my skirt and my shirt because it's normally a night flight. And that's when I'll bloat. And, you know, if I am having a flare or feeling uncomfortable, then that's like my go-to thing so it's, I've become this habit which I didn't even know I'd done until recently where I'll wear my my dress when I'm feeling like a little bit better um and then I've got the, the skirt and I don't know if you girls do that as well if you've got different options I do the same thing yeah so yeah. It, and it's just it's just happened actually I'm like oh yeah I realized I do that it's like my other half you pointed it out to me and I was like oh yeah I do and I hadn't even thought and with with BA as well something that's really good is um we, we can preference bid for our trips and days off and things um, so before my surgery, I, I touch wood, I don't have to do it so much now, but before my surgery, I could um, use like a, a tracker of my periods, like an app. Um, and, you know, my first couple of days would always be my worst. So I, I could, you know, if when it was really bad, when I was waiting for my surgery, I, I could bid for those days off. So I, I knew I wasn't flying or, you know, perhaps a shorter duty or landing on that day. So you can go straight to bed and, you know, if you land nice and early. So, yeah, that you know, it, it's funny how you, you can manage it with, with different things that you wouldn't even think about really you just get on with it so, I mean, with the uniform anyway. as well like the little at the side <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And I, and I just have I to say yeah. you know for anyone who is out there who works in within the uniform it's maybe um you know check into your your managers or something about that flexibility of a different type of something maybe with elastic or mm. the ability to pop you know instead of having that dress on that day having that you know just the flexibility d jump in yeah um <laughs> just on that really i think that's something that we sort of encourage we do a lot of talks with ftww to employers about not just endometriosis like a whole host of other sort of health issues or reasons as to why they're female employees might need those sort of adjustments in the workplace and that's one of the ones that comes up a lot so in any sort of profession and in any company where there's a, a uniform you know we've had members who were going through menopause who've requested a cotton shirt rather than a polyester shirt you know so there's lots of sort of accommodations that can be made and a lot of it comes from recognizing your rights as disabled people and I think in Wales, we're quite lucky in a way because Welsh government, like over 20 years ago, committed to embedding the social model of disability. Whereas as a society, we're still quite obsessed with the medical model. So I sort of went through that. And I think that's the thing. The social model isn't necessarily reaching all of the areas that it needs to. So, you know, I uh, in one of my jobs, I wasn't allowed any accommodations. You know, I wasn't allowed to work from home because I didn't have a diagnosis. And then like so many people, I went through those hoops to try and get that diagnosis and was told a bit like Beth, there's nothing wrong with me. I had IBS. So then having to go back to that place of employment and say they said there's nothing wrong with me just further sort of stigmatized me. So 
the social model is much more about kind of respecting our symptoms and yes they do disable us but it's those other sort of issues as well that we will encounter in society you know that could be anything from you know we're flying isn't it so if you're disabled and you want to fly you need to make those sort of requests for assistance and things like that so yeah it can be really tricky I think but I think if more organizations if more public services sort of commit to the social model that will also empower more people because it stops you I'm talking from experience now it stops you from thinking I'm broken I'm damaged there's something wrong with me you know internalizing all of these nasty things that you wouldn't even dare say to your best friend if they were going through the same thing you know of actually being like okay this is happening to me but also if I could just have this accommodation if I could just work from home you know all of those different things that can be really helpful and I mean yeah I mean obviously I work for FTWW now I work entirely from home you know remotely occasionally I go to the senate or something like that for a meeting but yeah I do it all from home and flexibly which I appreciate isn't necessarily an option in your <laughs> career areas but I think for those of us who are sort of thinking oh my gosh I'm really really struggling you know there are thing more things that employers can do as well so hopefully if there's more employers watching this which I hope there will be as well they'll sort of think of those things too but I also wanted to say how great it is that you've got men involved with your forums as well, because endometriosis and so many other health issues are seen as exclusively female, whereas actually there's evidence that there are cisgendered men with endometriosis. You know, a lot of trans people have endometriosis, non-binary people, intersex. So although predominantly it impacts women and people assigned female at birth, it can impact anyone and there's more sort of research being done to show that. So I think that's amazing that they're getting involved, but it mm -hmm. shouldn't also just be so as they can support other people. You know, it might be that they're living with symptoms or that we can raise awareness that it isn't just, as we know, it's not a menstrual health condition and it's still dismissed as being a menstrual health condition. So it's a full body disease. So if they can sort of start to understand that and help us spread the word. I think that'll be amazing. Thanks, Dee. Has anyone got, I mean, at the moment, we um, haven't got any more questions. So if any of our attendees do want to put a question in, then please type it in. And um, unfortunately, we seem to have lost Fionn, uh, which is a shame. But, um, but if anyone's got any questions for any of our panellists, then please do pop them in there. The chat if we now. do have a question for Fionn, we can always pass it on to her. Can't exactly. Really? And we can get the to answer, answer to you as well. But um, yeah, if anyone's got any questions, then please do pop them in the, the chat and we're happy to answer anything. Has anyone got any questions for each other? In the meantime. <laughs> I do for, again, um, the BA girls. <laughs> <laughs> It's a personal one because I'm flying <laughs> in two weeks and I just want to know is I do have any tips to help with the bloat on a flight because I I struggle the first few days of holiday with the bloating and the water retention do you have any sort of tips I can use for my flight to help really peppermint tea peppermint, peppermint tea is my peppermint yeah tea. peppermint tea is my and um, you know like peppermint oil capsules, capsules. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, peppermint. <laughs> just peppermint yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> on the flight I, take it on the yeah. flight yeah just okay. peppermint just peppermint just bring all the peppermint okay i no used good. to use um bu patches as well i've had a hysterectomy and had second excision surgery at the same time and i had That's a right. denomiosis as well i should add so it's <laughs> i didn't have a, a I used to take the capsules about an hour yeah. before the flight mm. Mm -hmm. so I do, perhaps also EU not... patches work really well um okay. so I used to use those when I was flying but also like don't be afraid to book that assistance as well because for me yeah. like I, I've got ME and fibromyalgia as well so I can't stand in queues anyway but mm. I found um 
yeah, just sort of being able to skip those queues and get through security faster and things like yeah. that mm. really helped me on flights. I know I don't yeah. work for BA, but I have to. <laughs> quite, quite, a um, quite a lot of our customers, I'm noticing more and more, have got, you know, the Sunflower lanyard as well. Yeah. Um, mm. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't, um, there's, you know, when they're boarding, obviously, I, I never ask, but I think it's just good to have that awareness in case, you know, something is going on that you perhaps don't want to say, but then if something is to happen and you don't feel well, yeah. if you've got that, I think it just, I always make a mental note, like when the customer's getting on, I'm like, right, that person got a sunflare on your arms, there's something going on that we don't know about. So I think, and you can get those, I don't know where you're traveling from. I, I don't know whether they're all airports do, but I know you can get them from Heathrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's one of those, isn't it? And I think all of us can feel it in a way that, I struggle sometimes to go, oh, actually, I need help because you're so <laughs> used to pushing through and being like, no, I'm getting like, no, on with this it. Is normal and, and everyone suffers this way. So I, I think Fionn touched upon it, you know, even though I was diagnosed in 2021, it's still so new to me. And, and I feel I'm still getting used to going, actually, it's OK to ask for help because I have a really chronic condition and I'm unwell yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's OK to be unwell. So yeah, no, thank you. I was just curious. I was, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I, I was free once, but obviously very much a passenger at the moment. And I would say the biggest <laughs> thing is uh, <laughs> avoid the alcohol. <laughs> don't don't, don't <laughs> get too excited no. for the alcohol. Um, <laughs> obviously keep very hydrated. And I've even taken to taking like a diarolite or something at the beginning oh, salt, yeah. which helps. So it keeps the hydration level up because some of the aircraft types can be very dry, yeah. Mm, so it helps, yeah. especially, yeah. So definitely, that would be my tip. But yeah, careful the alcohol. And all, also, <laughs> doesn't help. Also, I'm not, I'm not sure whether you're going a, a long or a short flight, but like moving around, especially if you're on a long haul, because mm. I'm so much better when I'm at yeah. work because I'm always up and around. When I travel as a passenger, I'm, I'm awful. I, I feel worse than if I've worked. I, I would rather work than passenger. Um, so yeah, just you know, walking around, mm. movement, just you know, it's it's never it's never a problem, you know, for, for mm. us as cabin crew. It's nice to have a chat and things. So you know, mm. as long as the trolleys are away and everyone, yeah. Okay, oh, thank kind of thing you. To, to walk around. Oh, and we've had okay, some cool. questions so um one was how do we sign up to the friendly scheme if we're interested please do go to our website and um, there's details on there and our lovely uh, my lovely colleague julie will be more than happy to get in touch with you and talk through that with you so please do contact us and then there's a question for beth um i'm looking into joining the police force through the detective pathway I'm wondering what the best way to handle disabilities when applying for this type of position might be. Okay, interesting. Well, um, firstly, uh, Heather Jane, you have my email address, don't you? If I'm more than happy for that to be passed on, if you do want to have a contact who is a detective within the police, I don't know, obviously, if you have anyone that you can speak to, but by all means, have my email address and reach out. Um, I would just be honest from the start and open if you're happy to do that and just make them fully aware of it. Um, you know, there are reasonable adjustments that we do put in place. And like I said, it's um, we're working towards raising more awareness. Endometriosis is something that we're, you know, supportive of and, and people are aware of now within South Wales Police. So yeah, I would just make them aware. With regards to working as a detective with endometriosis, um, obviously on the pathway, um you will work in different departments so cid ppu child abuse um and then you, you will settle within your department again make them aware because there's smarter working there's flexible working in place especially for detectives you know within your role you can do a lot of the admin side from home you don't need to be in a station so i would say as long as you're open about it if you feel comfortable enough to do that make them aware they can put the reasonable adjustments in place for you when you apply but please don't let it put you off applying you know it's been a fantastic organization for me and it supported me um having suffered with endometriosis so Thanks, Beth. That's great. And um, Becca, who posted the question, I can certainly um, pass on Beth's um, email address to you uh, at a later date, probably Thursday. Um, <laughs> so I can certainly do that. Tracy, do you want to tell us how you know people would get involved in becoming a flight attendant for BA as well? 
Well, you want me to answer that question? Oh. <laughs> right, so um, <laughs> do you know what actually BA have started doing recently, uh, which I'm sure the girls will hopefully confirm this. Um, traditionally, that recruitment into flying was always full time. They've actually started recruiting part time, uh, which is amazing to obviously and um, within the flying role. It gives, you know, this Sarah commutes from quite a distance. The role does capture people from further areas within the country. Um, BA are always recruiting from Gatwick or Heathrow. And yeah, so um, Heather, help me out here. This one's slightly more expanded than this. <laughs> <laughs> just that uh, you know um obviously if we have got young girls out there who are it is the type of their dream job that you know what do they need to do to sort of look for that dream job to be able to apply for yeah, it um, i think the girls because I, I stopped flying a little while ago a while now about 11 years ago actually um so i think sarah abby and holly who have probably gone through the process a lot uh, recently than what I have of get, going into the cabin crew recruitment um, I know there are courses people can do as well um, cabin crew based um, to help them obviously because sometimes the interview is quite extensive and it's a lot of customer service based and obviously being aware of the, the main role within this cabin crew there for safety reasons not necessarily the service <laughs> uh, service second <laughs> um but yeah I, I, sarah uh becky holly um what was what's the latest recruitment and um best pathways into this I well mean, i think um No, go on, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that um, obviously it's we, we do have to have um, a medical um, when, when you do go through the recruitments. Um, we, we have, um, you know, our own British health services. So there's always that point of call. Obviously, we've got our dedicated person as well on the endo friendly scheme. Um, but yeah, I think, if, you know, if you're, if you're going through that process and you, you need to ask questions, you know, health wise, if you think you know, you could manage it, then, you know, don't don't be afraid to kind of reach out and say, you know, can I speak to one of your, one of the medical team before, you know, getting any further? Or, you know, do you think this would be suitable? Um, Because obviously they're the experts. And obviously now that we've just signed up since March for the um, endo-friendly scheme, then hopefully, you know, that support will be there right from the start. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And one last question before we finish the evening, and thank you all for taking part. But again, it's to the BA girls. How is the support when you're flying and get a flare up down route? So I guess what support do you have when you're you are getting a flare up when you're you're sort of en route to wherever you're flying, especially if it's long haul, I guess. The group. It's a massive help. I was just gonna say each other, I think the WhatsApp group yeah. is busy. <laughs> The group, <laughs> definitely. And if you've got an understanding manager, the majority of yeah. them understand it. They're they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. It's not I only the group. Yeah, and I suppose if you were really ill, damn root in a flare, but you needed to be hospitalised, we've got what's called Global Lifeline within mm. BA. So this mm. covers all crew down route mm. if you had to see a doctor and everything so you're always supported by that part of the company as well um so yeah that's a, obviously if you really you need to be you know uh seen at that sort of level but like personally for me um i always leave my my contact number on on our briefing sheet for my crew um obviously the normally the minimum we'll do is you know 24 hours down route so they can reach me um whether you know they want to contact me via phone or, or text me you know if it's the middle of the night so if, if there is something wrong I always you know I'd like to put my I'd like to think I, I don't know Abby and Holly if that happens with, with all managers but you know just so I am the first point of call if they do need to then escalate that and we need to escalate that to global lifeline or whatever they need I also think as well it's about finding a balance within yourself because it's easy to get carried away like if you've gone somewhere new and you're like oh I feel a bit tired but I've not been here before so I'll just push yeah. through and then you really need to like listen to your body as well because then a lot of like for our flights to the US for example we usually do a night flight home which is challenging enough as it is but if you're having a flare-up as well it's all about just taking time out and actually don't feel guilty that you are in this amazing place but actually you might need to take like a little nap or something yeah. um you, you know it's it's all about not letting it obviously limit 
what you do in your own time in these wonderful places but also just you know listening to your body as well I think that's an excellent Definitely. point Holly I think um yeah I am testament so if anyone is thinking oh yeah just keep pushing through it'll be fine mm. it's not fine <laughs> like I now have ME so and that is probably a direct result of constantly pushing through not only my symptoms but every time I was getting run down so then getting colds and things like that so it's really important to yeah just sort of take that moment and there's um we really advocate for pacing as well so it, it's essentially energy management and it's a sort of recommended thing to do for people with ME but if you have any kind of like chronic fatigue whatever that is linked to pacing can be really really effective and um, we've got a brilliant um video in our in our Facebook group that we did with a disabled OT called an occupational therapist story called Joe Southall and that was really beneficial to us and actually that's what keeps me me working and I was able to do my MA alongside my work as well a couple of years ago and that's all because of pacing because I don't have treatments for any of my conditions so yeah we definitely recommend pacing and yeah, it can be so frustrating, but if you sort of plan in that rest time as well, sometimes that can help you have a bit more energy then later on to go and sort of, um, you know, explore. <laughs> but I've seen there's a question in the chat, so I'll type my answer to that. Thanks, Dee. So thank you all, as I say, for joining us. It's been absolutely wonderful. If anyone does have any questions, Sophie, um you've got my email address on the invitation so please do message me and i will certainly pass it on and then get the information back to you um and as i say becca i'll send you beth's address as well the email address and again thank you everyone for for joining us this evening hope um hope you will go out there and unleash your potential <laughs>